I want to welcome everyone in the audience back to uh, their now um, numberless uh, conversations that uh, I've had with um, uh, some of our very distinguished authors in Sapir. Uh, Joshua Katz, now at the American Enterprise Institute for many, many years, uh, a professor at uh, Princeton uh, University is uh, my guest and the uh, author of uh, The Culture of the Canceled, which appears in our latest, if you, I'm holding this up to the screen, if people can see it clearly, our latest issue, our seventh of uh, Sapir, um, uh, which we devoted to the subject of cancellation uh, because it has become such a very large topic, not only in American intellectual and cultural life, but specifically in Jewish uh, intellectual and, uh, and cultural uh, life. I think you wrote a landmark essay, Joshua, and, and an important one because uh, it, gives, um, it gives readers a sense of hope that they might not otherwise, uh, not otherwise find. Let me just, just, just before we, we get started with our conversation, uh, just uh, if, if those of you who have not been on these calls before, uh, we, the way it works is I speak with uh, our, my guest for about the first 40 minutes of the hour, give or take a couple minutes. Um, and then I turn it over to audience uh, to audience questions. So there is a Q and A box at the bottom of your screen, and as the conversation proceeds and uh, questions occur to you, uh, questions are, are are sentences that end with question marks, not not statements that end with periods. Um, put them into the Q and A function, and I will try to get to as many as I can. I promise. I will, I will go out of my way to select the harder questions, if that's at all possible. We wanna have a real conversation here. And so you shouldn't hesitate to ask uh, uh, respectful, but tough, uh, tough questions. Um, and uh, I urge you uh, at sapirjournal.org to read not only uh, Joshua's uh, essay, but a whole collection of wonderful uh, really extraordinary pieces from some 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 very distinguished uh, very distinguished uh, authors. We spoke with the novelist Lionel Shriver not long ago, uh, Jonathan Rauch, David French. I'm just looking at some of the names here: David Wolpe, Ed Rothstein, another superb essay, Saul Rosenberg. Just some really great stuff in here. So make sure to 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 spend some time with with the entire journal. Joshua, I want to talk about your piece because uh, when I think of people who have uh, experienced cancellation, I can think of a few people who went quite through the ringer uh, the way that uh, you did. You, you, by rights, you should not be as uh, positive a person as uh, you seem you seem to be in, in all of my personal uh, personal meetings with you, and you begin your your essay by describing a moment just a few months ago when uh, it reminded me a little bit of Churchill's description of, I think, May 10th, 1940, <laughs> when he finally became prime minister of Britain at, at the country's hour of peril, and yet he slept soundly. And you talk about sleeping soundly that night. And just tell us why, why that was. So this is a true story. I mean, it's not that I'm in the habit of writing things that are untrue, but somebody might look at that first paragraph, and that first paragraph says that the day I was fired was effectively the first night I slept through the night in nearly two years. Somebody might read that and think, oh, well, you know, he's fudging it slightly. It took him a couple of weeks or something like this. No, it's actually true. It was as though the greatest weight had been lifted from my shoulders. At Princeton University, Look, the story is, is out there. It is out there in many forms. Most of those forms are very positive toward me and very negative toward Princeton University. You can read these stories and you can make up your own mind. But whatever you may think, I was put through hell for a very, very long time. And as soon as that was no longer true, as soon as it was over, I, I, I could sleep again. Does that make me a positive person? 
well, I, I don't know, but at least, at least my torturers could no longer torture me. Your, your case is unique to some extent in the world of cancellations, because there are a lot of professors or others who are being canceled in different walks of life whose uh, case does not quite get out into uh, public consciousness the way that yours did. Um, how is it that your case sort of emerged uh, um, to become really a public issue, um, not always the case with others? I suppose there are two things I would say to that. The first is a matter of timing. So I had the very, very bad luck to be canceled or canceled initially at the beginning of July, 2020. And everybody who is watching this will remember what this country and not just this country was like in July, 2020. So I was part of what one might call the first wave. There had been cancellations before this, but I was in that first month in which all sorts of people, prominent people were being canceled. Steve Pinker, Barry Weiss, uh, Mike Adams, who uh, then killed himself um, and, and I. Um, and I was by virtue of being at Princeton University, one of the more prominent academics. So that I guess, made people interested. That's the one thing. The other thing to say, and I tried very hard to make this point at the conference on academic freedom that took place at Stanford about 10 days ago. We could talk about that too if you want, but I tried to make the point that unlike most people who have been canceled or most people in my position who have been canceled, I actually did do something wrong. Now, I didn't do something wrong as far as what I said about um, campus politics. But anybody who knows this story knows that unlike many other professors who have been canceled, I didn't have a perfectly unblemished record. So this makes things sort of interesting. This means that there was something else for people to attack me for and put the two things together. This was a grossly unfair thing to do, but there it is. And what I would like to say about this is that if only the absolutely pure are allowed to speak out, we're in big trouble because frankly, very few people People out there are absolutely pure. Now, just to recall this for the benefit of uh, the, the, the people listening in, um, you wrote a piece in Quillette in 2020 in which um, you objected to a demand by some uh, of some members of Princeton faculty and staff for special favors um, or dispensations for them not offered to faculty and staff who were not uh, minorities. And you had a phrase in there in which you talked about a group that no longer existed at Princeton called the Black Justice League, if, if memory Justice serves, League. that you described as a small terrorist organization uh, that or a uh, terrorist group that, that made the lives of many, and then in parentheses you added, including many black students, a living hell, or words to that effect. Yes. And that was the trigger for an investigation uh, into you by the by the Princeton uh, uh, by student newspaper. Is that right? That is that is that is correct. Um, there are many things I can say about the petition that I objected to, and many things that I can say about how I objected. Um, a few hundred of my colleagues signed onto a petition. You can still find the petition online. It was a petition that was delivered to the senior administration at Princeton University. It is a laundry bag of uh, requests and mostly demands, some of which are along the lines that you just said. Those are uh, demands that are actually illegal. Some of them are not illegal, but are merely immoral. For example, constituting a committee composed entirely of faculty that would oversee the investigation of so-called racist teaching and research. Uh, so a few hundred signed this letter. And then I wrote what I thought then and still think now is a very mild response in which I said that some of these requests and demands actually seemed to me perfectly reasonable, but others uh, did not. Um, 
it's a very long list. And my own response mentioned a whole number of things. But unfortunately, everybody seized on this one paragraph and particular in particular on this one phrase. Uh, this was a very useful thing for my enemies to do because it meant they didn't have to pay attention to all of the crazy things that were in the letter that they had signed and didn't have to pay attention to all of the things that I said in my response that were clearly true or at least um, part of normal American opinion. With the now, I of the absolutely by what I wrote and yeah. the things that people have said about what I wrote in that little phrase are actually largely untrue. We can get into the weeds if you want to, but I stand by what I said. And would you have done it again, knowing 30 months later, everything that happened? Yes, there are very few things that I would do differently. It is of course possible that I would have rephrased that sentence, but that's a, that's a very minor point. One can always go back and rephrase sentences. First of all, I think that my phrasing was accurate and plenty of other people who know the facts would agree with me on that. But uh, the fact is that if I had changed that sentence, people would have gone after me for something else. It was a tinderbox of a time. Uh, I wrote this dissent, which I still think was very mild, but came at that time, and people would have gone after me for something. So do I regret it? Not at all. So there's a wonderful line in, I think it's All the King's Men, Robert Penn Warren, yes. when uh, some of the Huey Long character, I think, I think it's the Huey Long character, it's 20 years since I last read the book, says something like, between the ditty and the shroud, everybody's got something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, in your case, it was a more than decade old consensual relationship with, which you had had with, with, a, with a student for which you had uh, taken a years long suspension without, without pay in, in the Without 20, pay and without complaint. Without pay and without complaint in the 2018 academic year. This also happened at the time when Princeton, uh, I think fairly uh, ostentatiously, or honorably, but at least ostentatiously, signed on to the Chicago principles on free uh, free expression. And I want to ask you um, about that because uh, Princeton uh, and its president, Mr. Eisgruber, make make a lot about their their belief in principles of uh, principles of uh, free speech. Uh, Play it. Maybe I'm asking you to play too much of a psychoanalyst here, but how is it that you sign on to principles like that and then proceed to behave toward you in, in the way that they that they did? I have no idea. Princeton was the first university after the University of Chicago to sign on to the so-called Chicago principles. Um, this was a move that was voted through by the faculty at a regular faculty meeting. The Chicago principles uh, effectively as written by Chicago a few months earlier in 2015 um, had were enshrined in the rules and regulations of Princeton University. So this is all a very, very, very good thing. But Chicago principles and principles like this only work when they are actually enforced. And until 2020, until the world blew up with COVID and George Floyd and all the rest of it, I would have said that the president of Princeton was a staunch defender of these. But somehow or other, I mean, you're asking me to, uh, to play a therapist, which of course I can't do. And even if I were a therapist would be illegal, um, right? You can't uh, psychoanalyze people. Well, you're not illegal, to... you're allowed to do it in this country. It's just violates laws, which yeah, don't right. well, you because you're not a therapist. Right, right. I'm allowed to do it because I'm not a therapist. I, I am very reluctant uh, to, to do this, but it is as though a, a switch were flipped uh, in, I would say, June 2020, a couple of months before, a couple of weeks before the petition, a couple of weeks before I wrote my dissent, um, the board of trustees removed the name Woodrow Wilson from 
the School of Public and International Affairs and one of the residential colleges. There's plenty one could say uh, about that, what's good about that, what's bad about that. But this happened and like that, a switch was flipped and the university was never the same again. There is, is no attention at all to Chicago anymore, even though it's- One, of, one of the things you, you said in your essay, which you attribute to your colleague, former colleague, a wonderful guy, Robbie George, uh, was that uh, the experience of being canceled lets you know who your real friends are. Um, how many friends did you have left to you at Princeton within a month of all this blowing up? Oh, it's not a month. We're talking about hours. So let me re reiterate this for, for viewers. What uh, Robbie, Professor Robert George, uh, the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University, said to me and has said to many others is that when something like this happens, you really know who your friends are. This is a very, very wise statement. Um, I, there are so many ways in which I could quantify this. When people say, oh, 99% or more than 99% of something, people always think that this is rhetoric. You know, 99% means a lot, and I'm not gonna tell you the real number. It is the case that 99 plus percent of people I would have called my friends and friendly acquaintances stopped speaking to me overnight, okay? So a couple of days before, every single, every single day, inbox filled with uh, requests, happy messages, smiling puppy dogs, you name it, everything, uh, phone ringing off the hook, uh, every possible medium, do this, do that, help me with this, help me with that, thank you for this, um, uh, I haven't seen you in years, uh, you're still wonderful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Overnight, another, another switch was flipped. Uh, effectively, everybody abandoned me, but fortunately, Fortunately, lots of people, most of whom I didn't know, didn't know personally, or knew only minimally, uh, took their place. So I actually have many, many more friends and really good friends now than I used to. But it's a remarkable change. 99% plus, that's accurate. One of the one of the points you make in the piece is that there were there, there was a uh, th there was a tier of people that wrote you expressions of support in private. Yes. Um, are you still in touch with those people? Some of them. Um, it, it's it, it's a motley crew, so it's it's hard to think of of that group of people in aggregate because some of them were students, some of them were alumni, some of them were colleagues, some of them were students or alumni or colleagues at other places, some of them were prominent public figures not associated with classics or linguistics, my two academic disciplines, or with Princeton. So a very, very motley assortment of people. Um, yes, some of them I am still in touch with. I Nobody who did that is now what I call a friend. A few of them I would I would classify as friendly acquaintances. I, I call them in the essay braver cowards. Some of them were more cowardly than others. So for example, if you were a very young person on the cusp of a career and you wrote that to me, I give you a pass. If you are if you have a named chair and you write that to me, you don't get a pass. I mean, it's better than if you don't write to me at all. I do grant that, but that's ridiculous. Um, how quickly into this, how soon into this ordeal, because I think one of the benefits of this conversation, Joshua, is that there are people here who are watching who may be undergoing uh, cancellations of their own or may, uh, if not now, at some point in, in the future, what was what was the nadir of all of this? How quickly did it happen? And how long did it take for you, at least internally, to start turning things around? Well, there were many chapters. So there wasn't one low point. There were a lot of low points because the game kept changing. 
uh, things looked really bad, then things looked a little bit better, then uh, somebody would write some horrible op-ed, then things would go down, then things would look a little bit better, then uh, somebody would write some horrible article, then somebody would write a counter article, and so up and down and up and down and up and down. So it's very hard to answer that. The real torture was how long it went on, up, down, up, down, up, down. I mean, the ups were not very high, but it's not as though I could say it went uh, you know, down and then up again. It was, it was, it was a yo-yo. I mean, it was a sort of ever sliding yo-yo, right? So, you know, down, up a little bit, down a little further, up a bit, down a little further, up a bit. Um, a very, very depressing uh, picture. Um, when did things start to get better? Yeah. Well, there are a few ways to answer that. One is that I got married in July, 2021, in the middle of complete craziness. Um, and, you know, if you get married and you get married to somebody wonderful, that makes things a lot better. So that helped a lot. Uh, another thing that helped a lot was getting an appointment at the American Enterprise Institute. Originally, I had the appointment as a secondary appointment on top of Princeton, but with the idea that if I left Princeton, as seemed likely, it would become my primary, my main appointment. Um, and then, of course, uh, as I wrote in that first paragraph that we've already talked about, there was the day I was fired and then things really got better. So three different answers. One, getting married. Two, having an appointment at AEI. And three, actually being fired, which just made everything better. So thinking about, I mean, your piece is called The Culture of the Cancelled, which is really, it's a wonderfully redolent uh, phrase uh, because as you point out in the piece, uh, who would want to belong to the other kind of culture, the one from which you actually uh, um, emerge, the culture of the canceled is a culture in which you have friends from across an ideological spectrum, across a color spectrum, uh, all kinds of people who simply don't participate in, in this other culture from which uh, uh, from which uh, uh, from which you, you, you came. But I want to focus first on something um, uh, a, a little different, which is that um, you were in some sense quite fortunate. You weren't a professor at, um, I was always threatened in high school if I did badly that I'd end up at Cape Cod Community College. You weren't a president, at, uh, a professor at CCC. You were, uh, CC, CC, uh, you were, you were at Princeton. Your reputation preceded you as a great classicist and, and, and linguist. How does this translate to those who might be watching from less distinguished pedigrees without the benefit of an AEI or an, uh, another think tank like that awaiting yeah. them, expressing interest? Exactly. Well, that's, this is, of course, a very reasonable question. Um, here's the thing. There are a lot of people out there who have been canceled or who are, to use a common adjective these days, canceled adjacent. And we well, sorry, explain that for one second. Cancel oh, so so well, you know, um, well, you've been canceled, uh, but at the moment we're talking. I'm the canceled one, and you're canceled adjacent. The fact is, you've also been canceled. But there are plenty of people out there who are, um, I don't know, prominent friends of the canceled. So I mentioned the academic freedom. I, I haven't been canceled. I have stood on the rim of cancellation and looked into the Grand Canyon below. Uh, right. But... Okay. Fine. I mean, it's a question of how one how one defines yeah. this. But had I been allowed to go back to Princeton University, I I would still have been canceled, or at least I would have still considered that to be cancellation. Yeah. Firing was just the 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 gravy on top of the cancellation. Mm -hmm. Okay. The point here is that there are a lot of people out there who have experienced primary and or secondary experience with this sort of thing. And we really care. So what I wrote about was, well, the culture of care that we have instituted. So can I guarantee to you who are listening right now or who will listen later um, that you're going to be canceled and immediately roses are going to pop up? No. But what I can guarantee is that if you write to me 
and you write to other people who have been prominently canceled and who have made a show of caring, you're going to discover that it's not merely a show. Um, there are groups of us, both formal and informal, who are trying to take care of the problem and trying to take care of the people who are the collateral damage of the problem. So write to me and I'll see what I can do. What happens to institutions? I mean, I, one of the things we're witnessing is that um, a culture of the canceled is flourishing outside of the traditional institutions of American culture. And I'll give you an example. Last night, uh, I was at the commentary dinner, which is an annual roast, this time yeah, in Aaron. honor of my old friend, former colleague, uh, Barry Weiss. Um, yeah. The cream of New York society and Florida society, I might add, because I think a number of people flew up just for the occasion, were there. Her substack is a flourishing expanding enterprise, not just uh, uh, not just in terms of what's what's written there, but her podcast is doing extremely well. Um, uh, different institutions are coming up. And Barry's just one example among among many that are that are flourishing outside of the boundaries of <clears throat> of, of these established institutions. My question is a little bit different. My question is what is happening or what do you expect will happen at institutions like Yale Law School, like Princeton University, uh, other schools that are engaged in the kind of behavior which you experience? What's their trajectory? Yeah, this is the big question. And I wish that I had a simple answer to this that I was confident about. I don't. Um, so let me preface what I'm going to say by saying how I think people should work to fix the future. Um, and this is this is this is what I'm going to say. Some people are very optimistic about major universities, and some are extremely pessimistic. If you are optimistic, then get to work and help make those institutions better. If you are pessimistic, then um, don't spend your time doing that, but go and help new institutions, uh, para-academic institutions, uh, work for or create substacks and podcasts like, say, Barry's. Um, or if you're like me, and you're one of these middle of the road kind of guys who doesn't know what's going to happen, um, stick as many fingers as you have into as many pies. So I have fingers in pies that have to do with major academic institutions like Yale and Princeton. And uh, these are fingers that are trying to make those better. I also have fingers in uh, pies at so-called lesser institutions, many of which, by the way, um, should be taking this opportunity and many are taking this opportunity to say, hey, we're not like the crazy places, Yale and Princeton, and you should pay more attention to us. And I have fingers in uh, entirely different sorts of pies too. This is because I really do not know what's going to happen. Um, my problem with major institutions is that I'm an institutional kind of guy. Many of the people uh, who have been canceled in academia are not fundamentally institutional. I, I was born to be an institutional person. My father was a professor of chemistry at Columbia on the faculty for 50 years before he retired. I grew up just down the street from the main gates of Columbia University. Everybody that I knew growing up, growing up essentially, was um, the uh, child of a professor at Columbia. I mean, that's not quite true, but an awful lot of them. And I knew a lot of professors. And this was the only thing I ever wanted to do. So it's very difficult for me at this age to say, oh, let's just throw it all away. I would still like to fix it. Is it possible? I don't know. But I'm going to play institution builder as long as I possibly can. So uh, I'm going to guess that some of the people listening in to this conversation are possibly deans or even presidents of maybe not Yale or Princeton, but other uh, major American uh, brand name institutions. And they 
exist in these hot ideological they they're they're operating ideological hot houses where their nominal authority because of their title is constantly undercut by uh, a culture uh, that is uh, hostile, if not inimical, to um, free thinking, to intellectual heterodoxy, to experimentation, to a tolerance for views that aren't uh, aren't in in line with mainstream views at at the school. So, to these deans, presidents, provosts, who um, who in their heart know that there's a deep problem, but are confronted with a, an ingrained culture, which is not easy to reckon with, not easy to reform. <clears throat> what would your message to them be? Message number one is get rid of as much of the administration as possible. When I started at Princeton in 1998, I think that within a matter of months, um, I knew I, I feel as though I knew certainly by name and um, more than that by nodding acquaintance and more than that in many cases, much more than nodding acquaintance, I feel as though I knew every single minor and middling and high administrator on campus. And that I don't think was special to me. Uh, Princeton was and remains a, a, a bit of a fishbowl. And so people know one another. But the fact is, it was possible to do that because the administration was there to serve the students and to serve the faculty. And, you know, it was it was an appendage, effectively. These days, as of course, you know, and as most people who are paying any attention to academia who are watching know, um, administrative bloat is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, at Yale, it's particularly spectacular, but uh, everywhere, it's, it's just unbelievable. There are huge numbers of minor deanlets everywhere doing frankly, no work at all, or rather work that is antithetical to what institutions are supposed to be doing. Now, I understand that some of these positions are necessary by law. I understand that laws come in and then you need a bureaucratic apparatus to, uh, to monitor things like federal law. I do get that, but fire the administrators get rid of them. They're creating a major, major barrier between you, the president, the provost, the deans, the serious uh, administration, and everybody else. Get rid of them. Step one. Step two. Uh, step two. Uh, step two. Step two is to stand firm. So if you have principles that you believe in, especially if they're enshrined in rules and regulations, but even so, if you have them, stand up for them. You, you're, you're the president, you're the provost, you're the dean of the faculty, you're the dean of the graduate school, you're the dean of the engineering school, you're the dean of the medical school, you're the dean of the law school. It's your job to set an example. Do not bend to deanlets, do not bend to students, do not bend to faculty members who are not acting in good faith, just don't do it. Yeah, it occurs to me that every president at a, or provost at an institution like this really needs an air traffic controller's moment for those, I'm sure most people on this call know what I'm talking about, the, the, the day in 1981 when Air traffic right. controllers right. threatened to strike and President Reagan fired them and put in uh, Air Force personnel to handle air traffic control uh, in the United States afterwards. And people got the message pretty quickly. I felt that at the University of Chicago, my own alma mater, um, when a dean of students sent a note that went public yes. saying, uh, we, we don't have safe spaces at this university it got people's attention. As a matter of fact, made uh, the University of Chicago a kind of a focal point for the yes. respect and admiration of many of us who felt like that someone, some some great American university had to stand for, for these pr principles. And Bob Zimmer made that, you know, his 
his life's work uh, and, and and to his to his infinite credit made him one of the great presidents of the University of Chicago, which is more than can be said for so many of the presidents and provosts. Now, I would add a third thing, and I wonder what your reaction is. Uh, can Josh. I can I just can I just jump in yeah. for one second? I just want to say Bob Zimmer was one of the great presidents. Uh, of a major institution in my lifetime. And we can only hope that his successor at Chicago will have half the spine that uh, that uh, he does and that he showed. And as for the letter, which was signed, I don't remember the name of that dean, but that was a wonderful letter. And let me stress, it was sent to incoming freshmen, yeah. right? It was not to people who were already there. This was This was saying, when you show up, at the University of Chicago, this is what you can expect. Uh, I will not bore everybody with what the freshman class that showed up at Princeton in August 2021 uh, had by contrast. Although interestingly, one of the wonderful pieces that we have in the cancellation issue is by a Olivia. junior at the University of Chicago, uh, Olivia uh, E. Gross, Gross uh, a really great a very talented young woman at the University of Chicago studying the same major that I studied, fundamentals, issues, and texts. And she describes an atmosphere that even there is one uh, that is um, couched in fear, couched in, in worry that what you say might be captured on video or uh, that will harm you socially, lead to a kind of alienation. So even at the best institutions in the United States, the, the, the current is moving in, uh, in the wrong direction. Third thing before we go to questions, and I just wanted your reaction to this. I notice a lot of universities are setting up institutions that are kind of of the university, but to one side of it. Yes. Uh, at, at Johns Hopkins, there is the uh, Stavros Nyarkos Agora Foundation, which is uh, bringing in a combination of scholars from Hopkins, but also other, other schools, creating something a little to one side. At Chicago, the Institute of Politics uh, uh, and other institutes of politics. Is that a possible mechanism for university administrators to create sort of zones of, of free thinking and free speech that have their own kind of governance structures and are, are have more independence than than the established side of the, the, the faculty and, and the departments. Yes. Uh, so before getting to that, let me just say something about the University of Chicago again. I published a little piece in the new criterion last month about the University of Chicago and about how this institution, although I have no ties formal ties with it at all, has been remarkably supportive or whose professors uh, and students have been remarkably supportive of me. When I wrote that piece, a whole number of people in Chicago wrote to me and said exactly what you just said, namely, yes, it's true that we're still better than everybody else in this regard, but you know, watch out. It's uh, it, it, uh, the winds are coming against us as well. So if this can happen, even at the University of Chicago, we're in real trouble. Okay. Well, now, what about your question? Um, I'd like to, I'd like to split this into two. So there are organizations inside universities, and then there are, that are little enclaves, fiefdoms, whatever you might want to call them. And then there are things that are even more para-academic or para-university. So they are not formally affiliated with colleges and universities, but they tend to have um, houses or institutes a block or two away and have many members of the faculty affiliated with them, but not with their official university affiliation. I think both of these are very, very good ideas. Um, the first one is, the second one is important because if universities are collapsing, somebody else has to take their place. Uh, and so maybe truly para-academic organizations are the way to go. Uh, but the first is really important, especially, I think, for what I'll call heterodox students. So if you're listening and you're about to go off to college, or you have children who are about to go off to college, when they go, they should seek out what the opportunities are for real um, 
well, real heterodoxy. Now, because universities are so overwhelmingly liberal these days, that tends to mean conservative enclaves inside universities. But this is actually very, very unfortunate. And if the winds were the other way, I would say exactly the same thing. If universities were conservative, then would want, one would want to have enclaves that were so-called liberal. I don't like this at all. The point is that these are supposed to be spaces in which people can actually talk about ideas from a heterodox point of view and effectively every college and university has them. Some of them, they're really small. Some of them, they're larger, but go and seek them out. And um, if you're a member of the faculty at one of these institutions now, um, join and help build. We're going to turn to audience questions, as promised, in the last 20 minutes of this conversation. I feel we could talk for, for hours on this subject. It's, it's, it's Unfortunately, hard yeah. to think of a more uh, salient subject. Um, uh, in American cultural life today. But isn't that um, annoying, right? I mean, sorry? this is a salient topic, but there are there are real problems in the world. The idea that one has to spend one's time dealing with junk like this at, at such a level is incredibly irritating, right? I mean, and so I disagree because I think yeah. that the hardest thing uh, in a culture of enlightenment is to maintain a culture of enlightenment Precisely because in a culture of a culture of enlightenment always allows the things that can kill it to flourish, and so it's it is the core question of democratic and liberal democratic life. How do you keep it going? Um, I mean, yeah, it would be great if we could talk about you know Xi Jinping and the future of uh, I don't know the Indo Pacific, um, but uh, we're not going to be able to talk about that unless we can preserve. Uh, the very thing that we're we're seeking, you know, the, <laughs> the this this is of the course right. Democratic line. This is of course this is of course right. I don't think we actually disagree, or if we disagree, it's just that I I find it so difficult to believe, perhaps because I was naive for so long, that we have to spend so much time shoring up matters that I consider to be so basic, such that yeah. we could then discuss much larger uh, socio political matters. Oh, anyway. All right, let me let me get to our, our patient audience here. Saul Raw asks, although I am in total agreement with your positions at Princeton, do you think you were naive when you first questioned the quote unquote party line at Princeton? Well, I was certainly naive, but I don't think that I was naive in questioning the party line. Um, I was naive because it really did not occur to me that the, the words, which I, I keep using the adjective mild, but frankly, go and read what I wrote on July 8th, 2020. It was really mild. It really, really was. I, I was naive in, in not seeing that those words would not be perceived as mild, um, somewhat conciliatory and just a little bit cranky. Um, well, so I think I would, you were naive and not, and not appreciating the extent to which bad faith would be used against you. I mean, the fact that the yeah. parentheses, was, which was so crucial to your argument, was excised by Princeton administrators is... is yeah, well, that's a that's a that's a that's another story which we should get into another time. But if you if you Google this question, this is a particular outrage. So sure, I was naive, but I was a naive person. I didn't. I I, I don't. Well, let me leave it at that. I was I was generally naive, but I wasn't naive about this in particular. I was just a long time. Ivory Tower resident who believed in the Ivory Tower and didn't really think that anything was going to go wrong. That was really uh, there's stupid. a famous joke which takes too long to tell. I wish we had an extra five minutes. Involves a, a mathematician in Leningrad who says something that runs afoul of the party line, and he has to go into exile, has to run to Siberia, uh, and and ends up uh, joining what he thinks is a work crew. Um, and only at the end of the joke does it does it turn out that everyone in his work crew is totally familiar with Planck's constant. Because anyway, it's a long yeah, yeah. 
I'll, I'll tell you the joke. One it's a great day. joke. You've told me the joke before, and you should tell it to everybody at some point. Yes. Um, Michelle Braun asks, uh, do you consider the blowback given to Ye and to Kylie Ir Kay Irving, the basketball player, um, Irving, as yeah. cancellation? Are these responses, financial suspension, public condemnation, appropriate? What is an appropriate response to those who repeat and publicize scurrilous materials? An excellent question. Yeah, it is an excellent question. Um, I, I am not a um, I'm I'm not a big basketball fan, so of course I have been paying attention to the Kyrie Irving um, matter. Um, but I I'm I'm hesitant to weigh in on this specifically because I haven't been paying actually enough attention to it. I I I, I tend perhaps uh, as a mistake to to spend much more time thinking about the academic stuff than I do about say sports and entertainment cancellation. Um, yeah. Can I take a stab at an answer? Yeah. Take, I mean, so I'm I'm. I'm reluctant to speak about this specific case because there are going to be things, I mean, I know generally speaking what this is about. Um, and of course, for this audience, given that this is about anti-Semitism, this is a particularly important case, but I'm worried that I'm going to make some comment which is actually ignorant. Um, so I'd rather try to answer a question like this, which is very hard to do in general terms, or take a case that I actually feel I know something about. I, I don't mean this as a cop out. I, I'm doing this because I don't actually want to get a fact wrong. Let me just make a brief comment. Um, historically, for decades, it's been normal that when you sign, say, a book contract, you sign a morals clause. Yeah. Um, uh, this is not an aspect of cancel culture. It's that institutions feel that there are reputational issues. And if you violate them in some flagrant and well-known way, you are doing more than simply harming yourself. You're harming them by association. So it's distinct. The second thing is when someone like Ye, uh, uh, Kanye West, loses an Adidas contract, he's not losing the right to do what is his core work, which is he's a musician. It's the right to represent uh, Adidas as a pitchman, right? As a, as a face of Adidas. That's very, very different. If you, for instance, had been representing, I don't know, uh, someone had hired you to be uh, the, the poster boy of uh, the classics department, and then you became controversial, it would be different from your being fired by Princeton for doing what you, it is that you do at, 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 at the core. You teach the classics, right? I, yeah. mean, I think it's an important distinction. Right. However, I mean, let me, let, me, let me try to get back at this by playing just a little bit. When I wrote my dissent, uh, I was not writing it as a linguist or classicist. And so some people said, well, you know, why is he writing this stuff, which after all is about contemporary matters? He doesn't know any more than anybody else about this. And I'm not completely unsympathetic to this, except, of course, that hundreds of my colleagues signed on to a completely insane letter, uh, most of whom I would say, are no more versed in these matters than, say, I am. So the line between what your actual job is and what your, I don't know, adjacent job is, is complicated. Sure. I mean, Kanye, or whatever you want to call him, um, is not primarily wealthy because of sneaker contracts. Um, Kyrie Irving, that's a, that's a somewhat different question. Um, I mean, when he says the earth is flat or when he says uh, nasty things about Jews, is he actually acting as a, you know, as a member of a team or not? That's a harder question. Fair enough. Um, Lawrence Haas uh, says, uh, uh, why do you think this has anything to do with psychology or the need for therapy? Does this not center on what we mean by free speech? Now, aren't non-politically views now can hang on? Here's the here's the main question. Right. Do we okay, not need do, do we not need to educate on what free speech actually is? That is, that free speech is meaningless if it doesn't include the freedom to offend. That's a good question. What do you say to that? Sure. I mean, I 
Um, on the one hand, I personally have a very thin skin, um, but I think that that's a I, I think that's a major character flaw on on my part. I am I, I I'm not I'm not exactly a free speech absolutist, but I really really do not consider words generally to be violence. So I. I, I tend to find it very, very odd when people get up in arms about uh, exercises of what I would call free speech, even if I find those words and even if other people find the particular expressions offensive. Uh, of course, there's a you know there's a large literature on this. There's a large literature on um, hate speech. For example, does hate speech even exist? Read Nadine Strawson on that. She's terrific, by the way. Um, Monty Krieger, uh, given your experience, hell for years, it is rather harsh to say you don't give a pass to tenured colleagues who express private support. How can you demand, how can you justify the ban that others suffer the way you have? Oh, I, I don't. I mean, it's not as though I go out there and I've never, and publicize the names, I, I've never, I've never publicly and, and almost never privately outed anybody. I mean, I've never privately outside of family outed anybody who was was in that category. Um, I, I, I'm gonna I'm just gonna say again what I said before. If you have a named chair at a university and you know that your colleagues have signed on to something crazy. And you know that your one embattled colleague uh, is being tortured. And you write and say this, but say, I can't say this publicly. And you will have a named chair. I, 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 think, that's, I think that's reprehensible. I mean, again, it's better than not saying anything at all. But do I really think that then the university was going to go and jump on 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 these sorts of people? I mean, they'd have they'd have to get rid of uh, they'd have to get rid of huge numbers of people if they did that. And I just don't believe that's going to happen. So I give a pass to to the young and aspiring, but I don't know. I don't give a pass to um, to the people at the top who behave like that. I just don't. But I'm not going to out them, and I haven't done that. I don't think that I have behaved unethically in this way at all. Um. Lawrence Kaplan wants to know, was Dr. Katz offered any university positions after his firing? One would one one uh, might have expected so given his outstanding scholarly reputation. AI is different. Yeah, great question. The answer is yes. Um, and then you might wonder, so why have I not taken them? <laughs> and the answer is really very depressing. The answer is, that I'm really fed up with this. I mean, here I said half an hour ago that I'm an institutionalist and I am, and I believe in institutions. I really, really, really do. Um, but right now, after all of that, I, I'm happier doing something else. That I would have said this a year ago, never mind five years ago, uh, it, it, it's astonishing that I'm saying this now, um, but I would say this. Um, I, I'm very grateful to some of the offers or potential offers that I received. Um, I hope I will continue to be able to teach and uh, do research at colleges and universities, but not as my not as my main job. I, I just cannot see that that's going to happen anymore. And that's sad, but uh, it'll make me happier not to do it. Pamela Pereski, who's a friend of ours, I, I, I'm Indeed. assuming it's the same Pamela Pereski. Um, I know. Uh, what do you each think people should do when they see someone they know being canceled, a term I use only with air quotes, and what, if anything, should people do when they see it happening to someone they know of but don't know personally, adding... I know what I think, but I'd like to know what you both think. Right, right. So let me start with the second one. Um, I am so grateful to people I didn't know who wrote to me and who have continued to write to me letters of support. And I'm well aware that there are thousands, literally thousands of people who expressed support for me um, 
whom I never responded to because the the volume of mail was so overwhelming. And at certain points, I was in such bad shape. But believe me, if you wrote to me, I did read it and it meant a lot. So yes, writing to people, being in touch with people who are in trouble, just to say, hi, I'm thinking about you. What a terrible situation. Uh, this, this really, really, really means a lot. Um, what should you do if you watch something on the ground right in front of you? Look, people have to start standing up. And at universities, which after all are the institutions that I know best, people simply aren't doing it. One person is better than zero, and two people is a lot better than one, and three people is a lot better than two. So if you have the guts to stand up for something, and then somebody else has the guts to stand up for you, you'll have a little wave, and maybe that little wave will become bigger. So just do it. We have time for one more question. So an anonymous uh, attendee asks, do you think free speech or the Chicago principles extend to official BDS and similar anti-Zionist statements by university departments. Uh, right, well, so there are two things there. Um, the first thing to say is read the piece by Samantha Harris in the latest uh, issue of Sapir, which is effectively about this. It's effectively about, um, well, it effectively makes the case, which uh, I agree with, that in order to have uh, pro Zionist speech, you also have to allow pro-BDS speech. That's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer has to do with official statements. Um, and this gets, in, gets us into something called the Calvin Report. So the University of Chicago has a trifecta of reports. We've talked about the Chicago Principles from 2015, but there are two others. There's the Calvin Report from 19... Um, uh, seven, uh, I think, and there and there's the Shills report from 1972. Maybe we don't have time for the Shills report, though. That's really, really important. The Calvin report from 1967, um, authored principally by Harry Calvin, uh, states that no unit of the university, never mind the university itself, can take an official position on a what's the wording? I don't know. Matter of of yeah, um, political import, I think. yeah, political or or, or social uh, import or interest. Now you can always argue about where the lines are, but the principle of this is very, very, very good. Universities um, uh, and and um, uh, departments should not be putting out pro BDS statements, but they also, in my view, should not be putting out pro Zionist statements. Individual members of the faculty and staff and so on are entirely free to do this. I think that's just fine. I mean, some of them I'm going to like the statements and some of them I'm not, but that's known as free speech. But universities and departments and programs and institutes at universities should not be doing this. And it is baffling to me that more universities have not signed on to some version of the Calvin Report. Uh, Joshua, I think uh, in the last hour, everyone in on this call uh, has uh, realized two things that Princeton is uh, infinitely poor without you but that um, AEI and Sapir and the rest of us are a great deal richer because of you. Um, thank you for your wonderful piece. Um, you'll find it once again, one little advertisement in our latest issue of Sapir, the cancellation issue, which you can find at sapirjournal.org, um, published by uh, the Maimonides Fund. Um, our next issue is gonna be on the subject of culture, uh, and then followed by Israel at 75 for the spring of uh, next year. So thank you for being part of this um, community of uh, thinkers and of uh, curious people. And thank you, uh, thank you, Joshua, for um, enriching us with this wonderful conversation. Thank you, Brett. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And hello to all of you out there. Um, go fight. <laughs>